I want to welcome Chuck Penner from Leftfield Commodity Research as our analyst. Chuck, thanks for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Gordon. Uh, it's good to be here. In fact, I'm actually just down the hall from Gordon, so uh, so we've been sharing notes back and forth, and uh, so I thank them for the, all of their help in getting me uh, set up here. So, uh, so that's been um, a very um, that's been very helpful and uh, a very informative first session. So I, I really enjoyed hearing about all of the demand and the, and the exploding demand. So um, I'll be giving some of the drier numbers kind of things uh, and starting. Uh, so now we'll be moving into the moving into the um, dry bean outlook. So if I just share my screen here and start the slideshow. Um, so I'll be I'll be talking about dry bean outlook and, uh, and and as I said I'll be giving some of the overview and some of the bigger picture numbers and then later on the panelists will be providing some of the uh, color commentary if you will and uh, giving some of their perspectives so filling in uh, the the blanks that are in the in the presentation so uh, as I said uh, we'll look forward to that part as well too so we'll be keeping us. Uh, moving along uh, fairly quickly. So from a Canadian perspective, um, we saw acreage uh, of dry beans really rise this year again. And uh, so the latest data actually just came out yesterday from StatsCan uh, showed that 420,000 acres of dry beans had been planted. So that's a steady increase. And a lot of that increase, as you can see, is in the green bar there, which is Manitoba. Uh, and then also in other Western provinces, there's been more growth. Um, and to a large degree, uh, dry beans have been pushed a little bit to the sidelines by expanding soybean acreage in previous years. And now, oh, share the PowerPoint. Sorry, I thought I had it here. We'll try again. I'm hoping that's, uh, I think that's working now. I think we, yeah, we, we're, my apologies for that. I'm still getting used to some of this. So what we have is we have the, um, we have dry bean acreage rising uh, largely in Western Canada. And it's as a result of um, soybean production uh, declining a little bit in the last few years. And so dry beans have recovered their, uh, their acreage base. And so that's a positive, that's a very positive uh, aspect because um, it's, and it's, but it's not new. Uh, we had acreage this high in 2006 and earlier. So uh, we're returning back to where we, we had been. Um, now I'm gonna look at it in terms of not by, not by region, but by type. And so these are not StatsCan numbers. These are pulled together from some other sources. But what we have is we have a huge increase in pinto bean acreage uh, this year, and that's largely due or, or solely due to all of the strong price signals that were going on. Uh, there are a few more acres also of uh, navy beans and of uh, kidney beans as well too, uh, and a few and a few other miners. Uh, but uh, black bean acreage actually uh, shrunk a little bit this year, uh, just because those price signals weren't there. Uh, when we look at the U.S., um, I have some, these are the three major classes of dry beans in the U.S. Uh, and what the chart shows is last year's is in purple, and then the, the green bar are the, the June acreage estimates from the USDA. And then there were some other ones that came out from a different department of the USDA in August. And so what they show is that acreage of these major classes uh, all increased from 2019 to 2020. And uh, that yellow, those yellow bars will likely increase as some subsequent um, as some subsequent um, uh, numbers come in. But uh, but overall, all three of these acreage increase acreage uh, dry bean classes uh, have increased. And again, just like in Canada, we see a very big increase in U.S. acreage of pinto beans and a solid one of navy beans as well too. Um, and just for scale purposes. I put some of the other classes on another um, on another chart, and so this shows uh, some of the some of the other uh, smaller classes in the U.S. and so their acreage. So the same same type of perspective. So um, acreage of um, uh, uh, kidney beans, both dark and light red uh, kidney beans, uh, both increased fairly significantly from last year. 
Uh, and then there are some other ones where it's, it's stayed roughly the same, including great northern beans. Uh, and, and there have been some declines as well, too. So a, a very mixed bag in terms of um, uh, for some of those minor classes. But in general, uh, if we look at the overall dry bean acreage, a, a sizable increase in Canada uh, and in the U.S. Uh, just last week, the USDA came out with their own um, uh, yield estimate, and they don't break it down by class. Uh, so this is for the total dry bean crop in the U.S. So not only is there an acreage increase, uh, but yields have also bounced back, according to the USDA, uh, yields have bounced back significantly from last year uh, when there were severe harvest issues and severe crop delays uh, that really damaged the crop. And so now the crop this year is, is uh, expected to be in the neighborhood of uh, just under 1.5 million tons. Uh, there have been some indications, though, uh, more recently uh, of some, of some uh, possible issues uh, related to frost and crop delays, uh, but they, they're not going to materially or, or seriously harm this production outlook for the U.S. <clears throat> In terms of Mexico, when we look at that crop, uh, last year, the uh, winter crop was down slightly, but the summer crop really was, was uh, damaged significantly. Um, this year, the winter crop that was harvested earlier this year uh, was already a, a slight improvement over the year before. Uh, and then acreage for the summer crop, the spring and summer crop, uh, also rebounded significantly and yields uh, are expected to be fairly reasonable. These are, these are still pretty soft estimates, so uh, not, a, not a really um, official uh, forecast in terms of that, but, but certainly a rebound back up to more normal production of dry beans in Mexico. When we look at some of the impact of these acreage shifts and acreage increases on, uh, on dry bean prices, uh, what we have is we have a sharp drop off for pinto beans and for navy beans. Uh, so later in the 2019-20 marketing year, there were almost none of those, almost none of those beans left available. Uh, and so prices just kept running higher and higher. And then at some point, uh, buyers just stopped posting their bids entirely. Um, then now that we've moved to a new crop price environment, uh, what we have is uh, a uh, situation where the pinto bean prices have dropped down to levels that are uh, actually below black beans and, and navies have also dropped off sharply as well too. Uh, and other classes have done the same thing. The one exception, of course, is black beans, which never got into the 2019 party, if you will, and uh, have largely stayed the same. So there's been almost no transition uh, required for uh, black bean prices. That situation for black bean prices isn't just a, Nor a Canadian or a U.S. situation, uh, but other countries as well. It seems there have just been very heavy supplies of black beans uh, in a lot of different uh, origins and in, and in uh, importing countries as well, too. In Mexico, there are dry bean prices uh, for Pinto and Florida Mayo. Uh, prices have, have really took off this last year. I expect once the spring and summer harvest uh, really gets underway, that those prices will come off the highs as well too. Um, but again, the black bean prices have just suffered, uh, have just really gone nowhere uh, in the last little while and because there's, there's no perceived shortage of uh, black bean prices. The other, this is a similar kind of a situation in Argentina where black bean prices are at a serious uh, discount to other values, whereas in previous years, um, the uh, black beans have been um, uh, in the same kind of ballpark as other prices, uh, other bean prices. Now, what we've seen in Argentina is that some of their crop problems have caused prices to, to rise. And, and these are, these are um, some official prices. Uh, and, and I would expect to see probably even more action in some of the, some of the live bids that are going on there. Uh, but bids there have all uh, taken off, which suggests that there are opportunities for Canadian and U.S. beans uh, to move into Latin America and uh, fill some of, some of the market gaps. Uh, and I just had to throw in one little chart for faba beans because uh, they are still a dry bean. Uh, this year, we're looking at a, a production increase and uh, possibly a yield increase, although the crop still needs to finish. There were suggestions that it was going to be late again, uh, and in certain areas of the prairies did get some frost. So the yield number that's on there is still uh, just an average number. We don't know what their the final number 
is going to uh, is going to end up uh, being. So uh, just to summarize in terms of just a, a couple of comments, uh, we're coming off extremely small uh, North American crops in 2019 because largely because of harvest challenges last year, which also caused quality issues. Uh, those tight supplies meant there was very little trade going on, very thin trade going on uh, with blacks being the exception. And then the acreage has responded uh, to those high prices uh, so this year. So uh, the biggest increases are in, in uh, uh, bean types such as pintos and navies and kidneys. Um, and for the most part, some fav uh, favorable conditions uh, and we'll get some more commentary again from our panelists. Uh, and hopefully we'll see a, a little more demand from South America for, uh, for some of the bean classes anyway. So that's all I have. And I think that from now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Cindy. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciated your insights. Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Brown, and I'm the president of Chippewa Valley Bean Company from Menominee, Wisconsin. I also have the honor to serve as the president of the Global Pulse Confederation. But now let me introduce our panelists. Some of them are returning folks who have got lots of experience being on the bean panel, and we welcome one new member. But let me start with Kevin. Kevin Sawchuk is a senior merchandiser with Viterra, part of Glencore Agricultural's Global Commodity Trading Network. He's based out of Tabor, Alberta. Welcome, Kevin. Next comes Dan Sturt. He is from DW Sturt & Company, a commodity brokerage out of Santa Barbara, California. And good to have you with us, Dan. Your background looks very much more Californian than it used to when you were in Michigan. So good to, good to see you. Thank and you. finally, we have uh, Marcos Mosnim, who is a senior trader with Global East Canada, a global exporter of pulse crops. And he's based out of Toronto. So welcome to you, Marcos. And I'm glad to have the three of you with me because now we're going to hear the insights into each of our regions and what your take is on the global pulse aspect. So Dan, I'd like to start with you. Okay, well, I decided that maybe what I should do is try to give a sort of, of I don't have any slides, I'm not that organized, but I, I can give everybody some a, a verbal snapshot of the potential supply and demand for um, the two primary classes of beans that are produced in North America, um, meaning basically pinos and blacks. And the corresponding relationship between the production and the situation that has been unfolding in Mexico. So um, based on what's going on right now in terms of harvest in, in, in Mindac, Manitoba, et cetera, um, I have, I have good news from an exporting standpoint, but also from a, a global importing standpoint. And I'd like to start with Mexico in terms of discussing what's been going on down there and why we have opportunities um, <clears throat> that, we, that, we, uh, that we definitely need because we have some uh, significant production of these classes of beans and Mexico is a very important customer to all of us. Um, Back in June, we all knew that pinto bean seed was really, really hard to come by in Mexico. And the Mexicans were very open with uh, discussing that situation. And they realized that they were not gonna be able to plant enough acres of, of pinto type beans in order to uh, take care of their market. Um, the, uh, the areas, the, the, the three primary areas of production in Mexico meet, uh, being Chihuahua, Durango, and Zacatecas, uh, Chihuahua, which is typically almost 100% pinto beans, um, and they typically grow between 90 and 100,000 hectares. Uh, they were only they were only because of the seed situation. They were only only able to plant about 70,000 hectares of uh, pinto type beans. Um, Durango, which normally produces uh, about 220,000 hectares. They planted 200,000 hectares of which 75% were pintos and, 20 per, and, and about 20% were blacks and then 5% were others. And then Zacatecas, which is mainly a black producing area, which is normally about 600,000 acres. They planted 65% blacks, which is again, very typical if, if, if not a little bit low, but Typically, they plant way more blacks, which they did this year, and 30% pinos and 5% others. Now, 
What happened though, which really, which really hurt Mexico was the fact that Chihuahua had a really, really severe drought. And of that 70,000 hectares that they planted of pinto beans, they're expecting that they're only going to be, they're only, they're going to, they're going to lose 60% of that. So due to the drought. So this is basically, their, their situation is going to open the door for uh, the potential for quite a few pinto beans going into Mexico. In fact, my sources tell me that the potential demand out of Mexico for pinto beans this year from North America pinto beans is going to be probably three times what it was last year. Last year, we exported about 700,000 bags. This year, we could conceivably ship maybe up to two and a half million bags of pinto beans, which is really good news for North American shippers. Um, current prices down in Mexico City on pinos, uh, pinot type beans is $58 a hundred weight. This is just for reference sake. Uh, black beans, uh, 45 for Mindac blacks and $50 for uh, Michigan slash Ontario blacks. And uh, uh, other pinto substitutes like Florida Mayo and Florida Bayo are, are 60 in, uh, for Florida Mayo and 57 for Florida, Florida de Bios. But so the point is, the current prices in Mexico are extremely high. Um, and uh, they don't, be, they, again, they haven't, uh, they haven't harvested, but they, they, they'll be harvesting in November. They have enough blacks to get through until November, but they don't have enough pinos to get through until November. So we're expecting the September, October timeframe, which we're in now, to be pretty good demand for pinto beans. And because of the high prices in Mexico, we could conceivably see our pinot prices, if they're low enough, if they stay low enough, we could, we could just go right on through and continue to see Mexican demand for some time for the pinot beans. And hopefully for blacks too. I think that the, they also you know, feel that the black consumption might be up higher too. So, um, and, and, and that should come in around two to 2.2 million bags. So let me just turn, so that's the Mexican situation. So that's their, you know, unfortunate drought situation is going to help us out in terms of the potential for demand for um, both you, uh, both North American pinos and also North American blacks. So just now I would like to just turn quickly to, again, the snapshot of the, of the production potential for North America. Um, our report, we, 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 go ahead, sir, am, I, am I going over time? You are. We're just going to move um, on. One of the other guys, and we'll come back with questions. But thank you. I'm glad we had that. All right. Okay. Well, All right. Thanks. No problem. Kevin, what are your comments? Sure, Cindy. Um, thank you very much. Um, before commenting on uh, on on Chuck's presentation and and the the, the beans, I do want to congratulate the uh, the first session today. Um, for those of you that watched it, I thought it was uh, incredibly informative. Um, wonderful job by uh, you know Chris, Angela, Paul on, on the, the great brands they've developed. But I thought Ken was really on point with, uh, uh, with, with the Gen Zers and what they're looking for. As a, as a father of uh, high school and university age kids who are plant-based eaters, they're surprisingly um, ethically conscious as consumers. And then um, you, they're, they're going to become ESG investors. So I think they really captured it just, just perfectly. So it was uh, a great snapshot of uh, who our future consumers are and who are going to buy all these pulses from us. Shifting back, uh, Chuck's presentation, uh, truly excellent. And, and really, uh, the, the, the accuracy, I thought, was, uh, you know, even on the minor market classes, uh, very, very uh, good. So it, it, it really hit all the, the key points and we're getting verification now that North America is about, if, if you look at say north of the, for the Canadian production, we are about a third complete um, on the prairies in Canada. Um, so Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and we are getting verification of those, those higher yields uh, trending so far above average. Um, Ontario, it's too early to say because uh, Ontario would still be uh, probably only about three to four percent harvested. They they are optimistic about the potential there in Ontario. So statistics aren't really there for the navy bean um, production yet. Um, but but overall, I would say the the white bean complex is among the more um, uh, bullish um, as far as um, you know supply goes. When we look at Chuck's numbers, the potential to build. 
um, on the major market classes, um, you know, some meaningful inventories this year, despite the, the um, low inventory levels, be it in West Africa, um, South America, Mexico, um, we do have the potential to build um, some carryover supplies on a lot of the major market classes this year. So um, things are looking very good in the U.S. I think the estimate is probably coming up on about 20 percent, uh, 20 to 25 percent across the nation on, on harvest activity. Again, most areas, uh, favorable conditions so far and good yield expectations. So at this time, you know, we're, we're ca you know, cautiously very optimistic about the potential for, uh, for North America to be a major supplier. Um, Cindy, if you like, I can, I can cut it off there and then we can come back to marketing questions afterwards, if you like. Let's do that, Kevin. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Marcos, what do you have to share with us? Well, uh, after so interesting comments from Dan and Kevin and the beautiful presentation from Chuck, it's hard to comment too much, but I can talk a little bit about what's happening in Latin America. Uh, Brazil has uh, had a problem with their black bean crop, meaning they are buying a lot of the black beans from Argentina. Price at the border between Brazil and Argentina is between 880 and 860. So saying that Argentina shouldn't be a competitor for, Latin Ameri for North America this year in the black bean. Uh, regarding other beans, uh, Brazil, I was talking today with our Brazilian office and we were sharing some prices. The pinto bean there, is, uh, which is carioca, it's quite expensive. It's at, well, we were talking about reals, but it's 290 reals a bag. Uh, their cranberry, it's, in order to go to Europe, they should be over 1,300. It's not cranberry, it's the light speckled kidney bean. They didn't have also the brown eye bean, which is a big export into India. So those prices are super high. So Brazil and Argentina shouldn't be really competing with us and with our crops. So saying that, starting with a almost empty pipeline, in North America, I don't think prices will drop much more. Thank you, Marcos. You know, I, I think we come back to that in just about all of our classes, don't we? When we talk about having an empty pipeline as we came into 2020 crop, people had stopped buying, shipping orders are coming in extremely quickly right now as we're trying to fill that pipeline back up. And I personally am very happy that this year we're going to have an adequate supply of beans to offer the world because it looks like North America is going to feed the world based on what our crop um, acres, hectares have been, as well as the, the yields. It looks very, very promising. I was just gonna say a few things about kidney beans, imagine. Um, one of the things that I'm pretty excited about is that since 2016, the International Year of Pulses, we've seen a fairly large increase in pulse consumption. And I can say that kidney beans have increased globally by about 30%. So seeing those large acres that we've got projected for this year shouldn't be a concern. It's really a positive aspect as we try to fill that extra need that we have out there. Um, we have only one quick little question here. And the question was, where did the uh, numbers from Canada come from. I think stats can were part of the information and I think Chuck said he may have gathered some of the others from another source, but for the most part, they were from stats Canada. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, um, the, the acreage numbers by, by province were from stats can uh, the other ones by type uh, came from uh, mostly from crop insurance, provincial crop insurance um, uh, numbers. Okay. Very good. Um, the other aspect, I think, Kevin, you were going to talk a little bit more about North America as we came into, or I'm sorry, about the U.S. as we came into it, but do you want to come back and pick up the rest of your comments? Sure, sure. So uh, as we do, and, and just supporting Chuck's comment, you know, on the Canadian side, um, it is quite easy to get very accurate uh, planting statistics in Canada with a very small number of processors and contractors, um, you know, bean dealers in, in Canada, um, 
quite geographically isolated production areas. And then of course, uh, as Chuck mentioned, the crop insurance numbers, we can, we can almost nail it, you know, right down to the acre in Canada with, with, you know, a relatively small industry by comparison to the U.S. Most years we're at only about 15% of the production of, of what the U.S. would do in dry beans. This year it's a little bigger. Um, we've been encouraged by, of course, tariff advantages the last uh, three years. Um, so it, it has a balloon for us, which, you know, we're going to see the biggest acreage uh, really since the since the turn of the century on, on dry beans. And, and, and that is because of that support primarily from, from Europe and, and tariff advantages. So uh, this year we could maybe be 20% of the size of, of the U.S. industry. So uh, a bit of a milestone or a, a flag for us, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, as far as uh, you know, the market side of it. And as you mentioned, Cindy, the, the, the purchase orders and the customer call rates are just at an incredibly high level right now. So even as we see um, supplies building on maybe some of these major market classes, we're probably out into, you know, the December or New Year period before true, um, um, you know, S&D or, or supply fundamentals, supply demand fundamentals really take over the marketplace because I think from a capacity standpoint, I'd be shocked if uh, if many or any dealers had much nearby capacity that they could sell. Um, so we're we're seeing you know demand for for all you know export destinations as well as internal you know within North America um, you know with the the high price finish for almost every variety or lack of supply you know supplies throughout the uh, the network be it on the store shelf in the distribution warehouses um, were all drawn down to um, probably his, you know very low levels maybe maybe the lowest we've seen since since the early 2000s so there is a lot of fill up needed before uh, true supply demand takes over I'm chuckling a little bit, Kevin, because I have a friend that always says, order early to avoid disappointment. And that's really what it has been in the bean world for the last couple of years. So as we look at having um, a lot of early orders and not a lot of time to throw in extra orders at this point, because as prices were high uh, last season and they came down, people just waited to take as much of the 20 crop as they possibly could. So that, that's been um, a concern. Um, I just had a question that came through that asked about kidney bean yields. We saw some blight on the front side of the production, mostly in light reds, though dark reds were affected as well. And right now we're seeing average yields without too much trouble. So that is positive uh, as well along the way. Um, so a question for you guys who are working more so in the navy beans, what, where do you see the demand coming from that may affect or may take care of some of the production that we have this year? Anybody particular? Marcos, you want to take that one? Uh, I'm not the, uh, Navy beans is not my main thing, but Europe is the main market for Navy beans and US. The demand is from, comes from the canners. Uh, Ethiopia, as per my understanding, is not a big competition this year, so you'll have a lot of canners coming in from Italy and UK. Right, uh, and I can certainly add to that. Marcos is is right on the right on point there, and that between Europe and North Atlantic, uh, again, low supplies, uh, lack of Ethiopian supply. We we anticipate lots of demand from from Europe, and then when you look at the larger caliber white beans. Um, a shortage, you know, or a very tight supply on the large caliber alubias and how that translates down to additional demand for small caliber whites. Um, again, it, it's quite supportive of, of the entire white bean complex this year. So even some non-traditional markets could be looking for, for navy beans this year as, as prices for alubias and, and great northerns uh, likely escalate a little bit. Um, we, you know, navy bean demand should be, should be very, very strong. That sounds great. Well, gentlemen, I believe that we will be winding down here momentarily. And our questions were pretty much answered. But for those of you who haven't been able to have your questions answered, or if you have more burning questions, we're all available at any time. Please feel free to reach out to us and we would be happy to um, answer as best we can. Now, if I read my screen right, I thought we had um, there we go. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, 
we will move into Gordon. It's been a pleasure to be part of this virtual presentation. All the best. Well, thank you, President Cindy Brown of Global Pulse Confederation, as well as Chippewa Valley Bean and Kevin, Dan, and Marcos. Thank you for your help as well. And, and of course, I want to thank uh, CFT Corporation again for sponsoring the Bean Market Outlook session. Uh, terrific job, everyone. And Cindy's left an open invitation. If you have additional questions, uh, direct them to Cindy and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do from there. So we're again, we're going to take a five minute break to allow you to uh, refresh your coffee or uh, stretch your legs. We are going to be back. So join us because in five minutes, we're going to start our chickpea market outlook analysis as well as our panelists. So thanks everyone. And we'll see you shortly, five minutes. <laughs>